Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our program tonight. We're very privileged to have uh, Mary Evelyn Tucker with us. And what I want to do in the next uh, couple of minutes is to just outline what we have for the program tonight. We're going to I'm going to introduce a couple of people who will be participating and helping with this. Uh, but the first thing I want to do is ask you for a moment of silent prayer or meditation for one of our board members, Arlene Gertzoff, who passed away last month, but also for all the victims of war in Ukraine, in uh, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, other places, and for those suffering from famine and hunger. And uh, so let's have a moment of silence for all those people who are suffering and that the UN tries to help. Thank you very much. Um, so what I'd like to do is just let you know what's going to happen here. First, we're going to have, right after I'm finished here, we're going to start with the hymn to the United Nations. It's a video. It's about three and a half minutes long. Then we're going to have the Secretary General's message for UN Day delivered by the Secretary General on video. And after that, I'm going to introduce uh, the two people who will be helping in this program tonight, A.A. Uh, a. Thant and Maggie Mudd. A.A. Thant is, uh, you know, the daughter of Secretary General U. Thant. She spent a lot of her youth serving as a hostess for him. When he was Secretary General of the UN, she would host events with him. And in the process, she got to meet some very interesting people. In addition to that, AA is founder of the Uthan Institute, which is designed to basically to spread the word about Uthan's philosophy. And his philosophy was of one world, tolerance, and live and let live, which I think is really a philosophy that should be with us today. The world would be a much better place if more people adopted that view. The Uthan Institute moved to uh, Yangon, Burma, and is now conducting educational programs on peace and development. The other person we have working with us tonight is Maggie Mudge. She'll be taking your questions and answer and for a question and answer session after Mary Evelyn's presentation. And Maggie was the daughter of a foreign service officer, so she lived overseas for many years. Her first job was in Washington, D.C., however, where she was worked for the Department of Commerce. And then she became, she moved to New York after that and uh, spent many years in international banking. And uh, so she's very happy to be here with us. She's been a big volunteer in Westport for many years. She's lived here for over 20 years. So that's kind of what we have in mind for tonight. And without... Uh, Without any further delay, I think I want to start with the video of the hymn to the United Nations, and then we'll go ahead to the video of the Secretary General. Then AA will come to the podium and introduce Mary Evelyn. Thank you.
United Nations is the product of hope. The hope and resolve following the Second World War to move beyond global conflict to global cooperation. Today, our organization is being tested like never before. But the United Nations was made for moments like these. Now more than ever, we need to bring to life the values and principles of the UN Charter in every corner of the world. By giving peace a chance and ending conflicts that jeopardize lives, futures and global progress. By working to end extreme poverty, reduce inequalities and rescue the sustainable development goals. By safeguarding our planet, including by breaking our addiction to fossil fuels and kick-starting the renewable energy revolution and by finally balancing the scales of opportunity and freedom for women and girls and ensure human rights for all. As we mark UN Day, let us renew our hope and conviction in what humanity can achieve when we work as one in global solidarity. Welcome to the United Nations Day. And today, as we celebrate the 77th anniversary of the uh, founding of the United Nations, we are also celebrating and honoring the life and legacy of Ruth Steincross Cohen. Her passion for world peace and unwavering support of the United Nations objective of the UN pro <clears throat> uh, proposed uh, to establish UNA USA Southwestern Connecticut chapter. She was a proud citizen of Westport, mentor, and a dear friend of many of us. For Ruth, Westport is a meeting point where people from different cultures come together to communicate and create understanding and unity where bridges are built. Today's topic, reimagining our environmental future together, journeying from impasse to inspire action, will promote an awareness of the overriding challenge of our time the climate crisis, and address how to mobilize the will and resources to address this grim reality. It is my pleasure and privilege to introduce to you our distinguished speaker, Dr. Mary Evelyn Tucker, who will lead us to reimagine our environmental future together. I first met Mary Evelyn in November 2019 when she was one of the panelists at the symposium at Sacred Heart University. It was one of the most enlightening programs and we began a conversation after the talk. Since then, I have been following her on her newsletter the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology, which is rich with resources. I always look forward to reading it. I'm so sorry that because of the time, I could not list all her achievements. As said in the program, she is a senior lecturer and research scholar at Yale University School of Environment and Divinity School. Aside from that, positions, she, together with her husband, Dr. Jo John Green, a professor at Yale and, and uh, expert on Native American uh, traditions, have created a multimedia project called Journey of the Universe, which includes an Emmy Award film and was broadcast on PBS. Her concern for the growing environmental crisis, especially in Asia, led her to organize with Dr. Grimm a series of 10 conference 
emphasis on world religion and ecology at the Center for the Study of World Religion at Harvard from 1995 to 1998. Together, they are also series editors for the 10 volumes from the conferences distributed by Harvard University Press. She is the recipient of many, many awards, including the inspiring Year Teaching Award, which I am sure is particularly rewarding for all teachers. May I now ask you to join me in welcoming our today's distinguished speaker, Dr. Mary Evelyn Tucker. What can I say? It's very special to be with you all, but that was a lovely introduction, AA, and I thank you. Your father meant so much to me as a Buddhist, as a diplomat, as a world leader. So I'm particularly honored to be here. And as well, to be more familiar a little bit with Ruth Steinkras Cohen and this inaugural lecture in her name and having her stepdaughter here, how marvelous. And Bill, for your leadership, along with Dennis Wong and so many others. I can't name them all, but I'm very, very grateful for what's happening right here in Westport. And I'm also delighted that my brother, Peter Tucker, and Sarah Tucker are here, who they lived in Westport for 30 years, and now nearby in Norwalk. Dear friends, they are. And another dear friend, Kusumita Peterson, from our days at Columbia and Teilhard Associations and so on. And it was a joy to meet at the reception um, some religious leaders, including Allison and Heather, trying to figure out what they can do in their parishes. I wish I could wave the magic wand, but that's what it is about, to right to the grassroots level, what can be done. So I'm going to launch in. Um, I have a passion for this material, so it's probably a little big, but I hope we'll have time for discussion um, at the end. So here was the title that was thought up in a wonderful conversation on the phone, and here's kind of my response. Um, what is an integral ecology for a flourishing future? And that's where we're gonna go in this talk. In other words, if we're reimagining our environmental future, and I love this from impasse to engaged action, that's where we need to go. So flourishing future, by the way, is a term that Thomas Berry used years ago, our teacher. And that's to say, it's not just sustainable, it's flourishing, it's juicy. You're on the Long Island Sound here. You have beauty all around you. A flourishing future is what we're looking for. And how do we inspire that? I like to say with my husband, John, it's not just a sustainable relationship, it's flourishing. <laughs> it has zest. Um, so I want to bring in the UN here in honor of this wonderful association. I worked with many others on this Earth Charter, which I really recommend to you because it brings together the sense of ecological integrity at the heart of our future, along with social and economic justice and democracy, nonviolence, and peace. So ecology, justice, and peace, that's where we need to go. And that's what many of you are already working on. So integral ecology is bringing together science and religion, joining ecology and ethics. And this is a huge gap, I wanna say, especially in academia, there's a huge gap here. We've got to pull this together. And I think we can, because the next generation gets this. Now Einstein says, science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind. Isn't that marvelous? Absolutely marvelous. 
Um, the environmental crisis at its heart, and more people are saying this now, is a spiritual crisis. Because we have the science, the policy, the law, the economics, the technology. We have this new IRA grant now to make the transition to a flourishing future. So what is missing? What is missing? We need the spiritual energies to overcome despair and disempowerment, especially of youth, but also of people of the older generation who are worried, like many of you, for your children and your grandchildren. How many would be in that category, worrying about children and grandchildren? Right, exactly. So this is what is going to motivate us. This is what's going to motivate us, the next generations. Now, I want to make it especially clear that for me, the spiritual, not religious category is encompassing, inclusive. It opens up the doors, especially to the next generation. And I am not talking about religions and their institutional framework and their fundamentalisms and all this. I'm trying to talk about what's the spiritual juice of religions and more than religions, okay? So this broad search for meaning and purpose and belonging, despite what's now being called eco-anxiety, Eco-anxiety, that's what our students have. So how to live life with connection to others, to nature, and to the universe. The stars in a place like Westport, right? It's out the other night, we're up in Old Lyme right now. It's mind-boggling. It's so inspiring. Here's what Robert Dorkin says. A religious attitude involves moral and cosmic convictions beyond simply a belief in God that people have an innate, inescapable responsibility to make something valuable of their lives and that the natural universe is gloriously, mysteriously wonderful. Isn't that marvelous? Marvelous. So, we know we are in this stress of climate emergency, it's Pakistan. The world is on fire, on floods, and so on. The climate refugees are now estimated to be 90 million, small number, and just escalating. And that includes the migrants coming north because of environmental conditions here and in Europe and so on. But we also have these problems of pollution the Yamuna River in Delhi, we did a conference on this river. It's supposed to be a sacred river, and yet it's deeply polluted, as is the Ganges, the Brahmaputra. All these rivers in India and China, especially polluted. Biodiversity loss is the third big problem that the UN has identified. Climate, pollution, biodiversity loss. We are living in a sixth extinction period. The Natural History Museum in New York has this on the floor of the Hall of Biodiversity, but it also says we can stem the tide of destruction. Stem the tide of destruction. What is that going to mean? What is it going to take? So I'm offering tonight, against great odds and with a great deal of humility, some responses of hope. This Yale Forum is something that hundreds, really thousands now, have participated in to try and create a response from religious and spiritual communities. I'm going to talk about Pope Francis's letter, which is hugely in, um, influential. Thomas Berry, our teacher, um, one of the great thinkers of our time. I'm going to speak at the end about journey of the universe in a cosmic and ecological spirituality that can light us up. Now, how did this work begin? I think our stories are always interesting to share. So I first went to Japan in 73, 74 to teach. After a pretty intense decade of the 60s in Washington, I was in college where Nancy Pelosi went to school too. We were dealing with civil rights, anti-Vietnam War, a lot of you perhaps in that same category. Here was Japan, even in those days, the pollution was beginning to grow, and they sent their industries overseas. I went to China first in 85. Here's Guilin in the south. And here, as we know, the rivers, the air, the cities, incredible pollution, like you cannot imagine unless you have been there, including both India and China which will change the face of the planet, and they already are, over two billion people. 
Now, I began to study during this period in Japan, Buddhism, I was fascinated with Zen, as I'm sure many of you have been as well. I studied Confucianism, though, too, which is kind of the cultural glue, the social ethics, what makes people polite to each other, makes Tokyo one of the safest cities in the world, um, where we lived in the 80s as well. I also studied Shinto, which is talking about the sacredness of nature, um, mountains, rivers, streams. So the origin of the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology was in my thinking in those years as I traveled through Asia, and it was a different world in the 70s, but the importance of China and Japan as it was beginning to industrialize and the incredible ecological destruction that we saw in 50 years, 40 to 50 years, this whole region where two thirds of the world's people live across Asia. So we as Americans have got to think even more globally. We're very Western European oriented, but this situation is something that inspired our work because ironically, many of these traditions, as I've just noted, have a nature-based spirituality. And I could describe that in great detail, but Buddhism is all about interdependence. Confucianism and Taoism has this notion of the qi, matter, energy, how you bring the qi in, into your life with qigong and tai chi and so on. The origin also came out of a very realistic understanding that we all know that there's problems and there's promise in religions, historically and at present. But I was very much inspired uh, in the 60s in terms of civil rights, because we grew up in a society that said separate but equal was fine, no problem. But when the religious leaders like Martin Luther King and others, and Washington was a hotbed of these changes, when that moral force began to spread out, and John Lewis, these were amazing people, orators and so on, things changed. And it's the same hope here. When the moral force of the environmental movement and the valuing of nature begins to explode, something is going to change. Now also, the notion that educational institutions, be they colleges, universities, be they uh, seminaries, be they secondary schools, and so on, is absolutely one of the great transforming processes for change. We've got two masters at Yale between Divinity School and, and the School of the Environment. But now, since this movement has begun, again, with the help of so many people, there are 15 graduate programs across the US in religion and ecology. Who would have thought it 25 years ago? The f another one was added today at Princeton Seminary. It's very exciting because the next generation wants this. How do you put together science, spirituality, and ethics? So as AA said in the introduction, for all these reasons, we were not scientists or economists and so on, but we said, what can we contribute to this environmental movement? So we began these conferences at Harvard. Um, this series, um, which took three and four years and the books, another four and five, um, on indigenous religions, on all of the Western religions. I hope the library has some of them here. <laughs> um, and as well, the Asian traditions, Confucianism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Hinduism. But I want to say once again, scholars who were not paid anything to do this work, they wanted their knowledge to come into being for a certain transformation. They got it. Um, we also have a series on ecology and justice, um, which includes just water, it includes defending Mother Earth of Native Americans. The one in the middle, Cry of the Earth, Cry of the Poor, came out in 97 by one of the leading liberation theologians, Leonardo Boff, and it's central to the Pope's encyclical letter. So we have a vast website. I think there's like a thousand pages. We've, we're trying to create a field and a force. So there's statements from all the world's religions on valuing nature um, and eco-justice issues, scriptures, bibliographies. I've got to change that because there's 15 <laughs> graduate programs now. But the force as well 
If you look on our website, you will see engaged projects all over the world of restoration of trees, of, of rivers, of salmon, uh, protecting turtles and birds and, and so on. And we have a whole section just on eco-justice, which I'll speak about soon. And hopefully the newsletter will be of interest to you. I want to highlight some of these individuals who have been much inspired. Wangari Mathai, I hope some of you know who she is. Um, she had Christian background, but also Kikuyu uh, from Kenya. And she started the Green Belt Movement with women, which just exploded in terms of reforestation. She got the Nobel Peace Prize for saying the environment and a spiritual perspective is the origin and the grounding for peace. She is, she's passed away now, but an extraordinary figure in this whole movement. I hope you also know who Robin Wall Kimmer is. Um, she just won a MacArthur Prize. And how many of you know her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which has been on the New York Times bestseller list? She's putting together traditional environmental knowledge with her background in forestry and botany and so on. This weave that I'm talking about of an integral ecology, extraordinary. You can watch um, her talks on, on YouTube as well. Now, I'm mentioning her because at the Glasgow Conference on Climate, what was so important and what became ever more visible was the presence of indigenous peoples outside the main uh, buildings, religious leaders, and youth. We could spend the rest of the talk talking about youth movements, which are truly a source of inspiration. Sunrise movement in this country, Extinction Rebellion, and others. The youth are taking this up. It's their future, obviously. Um, here is one of the great African-American leaders. I'm so glad some of you are nodding your heads. He just spoke at Yale this past weekend, um, Reverend William Barber. Now he picks up all the concerns from civil rights and social justice and is putting them together with eco-justice. He is prophetic and he has um, the, the poor people's movement was something that Martin Luther King and others started in the 60s, but he's picked up the seeds of that, and it's, he's leading a poor people's movement. Um, Vandana Shiva from India has been working for, she has Hindu background and so on, but she's been working on agriculture, on seeds with farmers in India. Um, it's a very, very difficult situation for farmers around the world, as you may know. So now I'm going to launch into uh, Pope Francis's encyclical and then Thomas Berry. So, and this is not about one tradition, it's just to highlight an example that has had a lot of effect. Because fortunately, Francis is lovable, likable, believable. He's not pompous and caught up within all of the problems of Catholicism and so on. But you can see here this cry of the earth, cry of the poor that came out of Latin American liberation theology is central to his thinking because he's from Latin America. Um, Thomas Berry, our teacher, he's speaking about the living earth community. This isn't dead. This isn't purposeless and meaningless. This is a living earth community. So the call then of integral ecology is for an eco-spirituality that gives us, inspires us with awe, with wonder and beauty of creation. And that is what, again, the next generation is embracing. And that can include earth-based spiritualities. It can include people in the sciences who love what they're doing and give us that sense of awe and wonder. Um, now, eco-justice is the sense of action. And this is climate justice. This is pollution justice. If you look at Flint, Michigan, what has happened there still? African-American communities without water, Jackson, Mississippi, Cancer Alley in Louisiana. So what is going to happen unless we do something about uh, climate change in terms of eco-justice? So care for people and the earth. And that's what this encyclical does. It puts these two together. The sub, it's laudato si, which means praise be in early Italian. And Francis, of course, St. Francis of Assisi, is the inspiration for the Pope. Uh, 
So Care for Our Common Home came out in 2015. And I used to say to my mother, we lived down in Pelham, I would say, Mom, if we have a pope who's believable, lovable, real, and does something on the environment, we have a chance. We have a chance because there's, here we are, this broad invitation. So it's to Catholics around the world, which are a billion, Christians, including Orthodox. He's very good friends with the Greek Orthodox patriarch, Bartholomew. There's another billion, and you put all these together. Uh, but the appeal was also to people of all religions, spiritual people, people and seekers. Now, some of you mentioned that you were trained by Jesuits. The Jesuit universities, I spoke to their alumni association this summer in Barcelona. There are 8 million Jesuit alums. It's the largest uh, educational institution in the world. Um, they've got 600 uh, uh, high schools. And they're making a pledge for their 200 universities all over the world. 27 of them are here in the U.S to move into this spirit of Laudato Si, which is a movement now. So that's an educational shift of some importance and some note. So the response of the world's religions has been overwhelmingly positive and affirming. They're writing their own statements just about Laudato Si. They're wanting to work with this Laudato Si movement. And a new film just came out. Um, earlier this month called The Letter, which you can watch. It's very powerful. Just a few individuals, but from every continent, what they have endured for climate change and some scientists saying what they're trying to do. Very beautiful. The first day, 800,000 people watched it. Now, the response of the environmentalists is also interesting. It's been very, very positive. Our, even our dean, our last dean at the School of the Environment at Yale, had us do something on the encyclical even before it came out. A packed auditorium with people from the law school, scientists, and so on. So scientists get why this is important. And Bill McKibben, one of my great heroes, said when he came to speak at Yale a few years ago, a thousand people were listening to him the next morning at breakfast. He says, Mary Ellen, John, this encyclical letter is the most important document of the 21st century. That is something. Now, he comes from a wellspring of Methodist background, is very sympathetic to this. But when environmentalists who've been at this a long time recognize this integral ecology, science, spirituality, ethics, ecology coming together, they're rejoicing. So the encyclical letter begins with science. It doesn't begin by preaching. He begins by listening to the science. His second chapter is this gospel of creation that inspires awe. He's saying the mystery of the universe is beyond anything we could imagine. And there's a harmony of creation in each creature, each creature, each species. That's what we're also understanding. The amazing communication of trees and forests and roots, the communication and sentience of birds in migrations, of turtle migrations, salmon migrations. Sentience is distributed throughout this living earth. And that's what he's recognizing with this interdependence of all life, a universal communion, saying that the natural environment is a collective good. Now the third, he takes a step back from science, from awe. What are the problems? And he identifies them so powerfully. <laughs> I've been reading in this area for decades. What he does, his analysis is incredible. Especially this instrumental use of nature. Is nature just for us and our uses? Is nature a dead object that we can exploit any way we want? Or does it have intrinsic value? And he's very, very big on the critique of consumerism and materialism, which we perform very well. And there's no one who's not part of this American problem. We can do something about it, though. We can absolutely do it. a culture of waste. People come to our country and they're like, the Europeans are like, how can we have huge food things, the waste of clothes and so on. Again, we're all part of it. This isn't too make us feel guilty, it's to inspire change. Market-based solutions, while absolutely necessary, if they're coming on with a sense that economic progress without limits, that 
is a problem. And there's all kinds of new ecological economics emerging, donut economics, <laughs> the uh, sense of renewable economics linked into the earth itself. So we've got to look at what is an ecological economics that can sustain and f help flourish these uh, extraordinarily complex ecosystems. The solution then, he gets the problems and then he comes to the solution, which is this term integral ecology, where he says ecology, economics, equity, and ethics must all be integrated. Again, a new perspective. This hasn't happened at our School of the Environment. You know, again, we have the science here, we've got law here, we've got technology, we've got business. Necessary but not sufficient until we weave it together. He's talking about the principle of the common good. Now, I've lived in Asia for three years in Japan. I study Confucianism. It attracted me hugely because it has this sense of a common good. You know, there's no future without a shared future. And I value individualism and so on, but it has overridden in the West a sense of what is a common good for future generations. He speaks, of course, of solidarity with the poor, with refugees, and of intergenerational justice. I like to say we have a handshake of intergenerational justice with our students. And they respond, actually, very, very well. Because we don't want to say, these are your problems now. And we don't want them to be giving us the, the critique, it's all your fault. We have to do this together. Now, the Pope uh, is a great inspiration to many people, and Thomas Berry was a huge inspiration to us. He married us, he married Peter and Sarah, my brother and sister. Why? Because he had we have some people from Czechoslovakia here tonight. He had, like Václav Havel, an amazing sense of spirituality that was connected to, woven into these earth systems. Havel's language was extraordinary, and so is Barry's. He has this first book, Dream of the Earth. What is the earth dreaming for us? Sacred Universe, when Columbia published this and we did the editing, we were amazed that a secular press like Columbia would call it Sacred Universe. See, we've got to re-inhabit that language. Yale is, I'm not going to speak at Yale about Sacred Universe. These are hyper-secular institutions, and we've got to overcome that. That's this, the point of this integral ecology. What? I did my graduate work at Columbia, did this work at Harvard, at Berkeley, taught at Princeton. None of these institutions can we really use this language. And that is creating such schizophrenia in our students. They can't integrate. They can't find meaning and purpose. So Barry speaks of the great work that needs to be done, and his, one of his last books was Evening Thoughts. So here's the language that can be inspiring, I think, in defining eco-spirituality. He says, at its core, even our spirituality is earth-derived. The human and the earth are totally implicated, each in the other. If there's no spirituality in the earth, then there's no spirituality in ourselves. What a different perspective. It's not out there in a transcendent God alone. You see, I mean, this is where the Asian religions and indigenous religions understand what spiritual is right here. Why do you live, want to live next to this beauty? It's inspiring, absolutely inspiring. He says there's a spiritual presence in all life, but we can no longer hear the voice of the rivers, the mountains, or the sea. The trees and meadows are no longer intimate modes of spiritual presence. The world about us has become an it rather than a thou, with a deep gesture to Martin Buber, the great Jewish mystic who had this sense, everything is a thou, everything speaking to us. The reciprocity with nature, he says, it is this renewed sense of reciprocity with nature in all of its complexity and remarkable beauty that can help provide the psychic and spiritual energies necessary for the work ahead. 
Again, we're attuned to the fact that the psychic and spiritual energies need to come forward because people are depressed, disempowered, anxious. So how are we going to help midwife new energies for the next generation? He speaks of ecology as living systems. Our studies in what we call ecology must lead to such intimacy with our natural surroundings. Only intimacy can save us from our present commitment to a plundering industrial economy. So his key ideas, he said even in 78, we need a new story that weaves evolution with spirituality, with meaning and purpose. It can't be taught as random and purposeless, mechanistic, have a nice day. And that is how it's often taught in academia. So where do students situate themselves? He says, we dwell in a sacred universe. We're in a living earth community. Earth is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. Again, the birds you see around here, your walks in the forest, the meadows and things, in this part of the world are extraordinary, but they're speaking to us. And this is one of his most famous lines. And then he calls us to the great work of creating a flourishing future. So the final part here, I've just done this sort of orchestration of many, many parts of a symphony that's emerging in religion and ecology with work of all the religions all over the world. It's incipient, it's new. 25 years is just a fraction, but it is growing and we can all help it to grow. And then we take a step back and we say, what is the symphony of the universe? What is the context in which our lives really take on a special meaning and purpose? We can get up in the morning with sort of a zest, a sparkle. We can turn that music on and go about our day. So Journey of the Universe, is a film um, and a whole project that was indebted to this new story of Thomas Berry. It's a film that's on Amazon, or there's a link here on the library um, as well. There's a book from Yale Press. There's conversations, interviews I did with both environmentalists and, and scientists, African Americans saying why this mattered, Native Americans, and so on. There's online courses, there's a website, there's a newsletter. And there has been a wide appeal for this approach to evolution, spirituality, ethics. From this, uh, next generation schools and universities and churches have used this, a curriculum has been developed. The last time before COVID, and we've showed it in China many times, um, there's 77,000 viewers. And incidentally, uh, as Ruth's stepdaughter asked, this is a symbol of the heavens in Chinese, Tian. And when you do the Chinese cosmology of heaven, earth, and human, that's their trinity. That is built into this film. There's no mention of God, because it was on PBS for three years, no mention in particular of any one of the religions, but the sensibilities, and I write the characters on the board, the Chinese love this, because they have that cosmological sensibility. So in conclusion, this cosmic and earth eco-spirituality is an appreciation for the sacred universe out of which earth and life evolved and to which we belong. Here's the origin, the great flaring forth of this astonishing evolutionary process. A minute, less than a fraction of a minute, larger the expansion or smaller, nothing would have emerged. These amazing facts that we're discovering about this story. Here's the birth of stars, we're seeing them now through the web telescope. And from the stars, all of the elements of life come. So the stars are our ancestors, as we're saying in this film. Um, here's the galaxies that are emerging, exploding. Our parents and grandparents had no idea that we live amidst trillions of galaxies. Is that not enough awe and wonder to inspire action? Here's a picture taken by a dear friend in central Pennsylvania over a lake. And here we are 
in our Milky Way galaxy. I just love this picture. And we can create music, poetry, and so on, which is already emerging to celebrate this sense that we live in, ex in an expanding, unfolding universe. Because it evokes in us reverence, respect, and responsibility. Reverence for valuing the complexity of Earth and the profound interdependence of life systems. Every ecologist gets this. And here's the moon in its different phases. I believe tonight or tomorrow is going to be a new moon, and there's a lunar eclipse that's happening. Here's where we are right now in Old Lyme, staying and doing a writing retreat with the rising sun and its inspiration, with the setting sun. We are inspired by these systems so that we must respect all life, a realization that life is connected, emerged here on Earth after billions of years of evolution. It's 10 billion years just of universe evolution, 4.6 of Earth evolution. And probably, we don't know fully, there's not life as we know it here in, in the solar system, maybe further out, but you know what? Why don't we take care of this life? Why don't we do that? Earthrise, as many of you will remember, changed our life forever because we could see that blue, green, marble planet with its living waters and clouds and so on as never before. It's a watershed in human consciousness that we still need to bring into our lives, our sense of direction and purpose. How astonishing. All of the astronauts have been so inspired by this trip around the Earth. So the responsibility then for f the future of life, responsible for the care and continuity of the living Earth community, the continuity of mountains, of rivers, of rainforests, of fish and coral reefs, of birds, of humans, next generations, and finally, to realize that we're living within a new story that orients us, I like to do this with a Qigong movement with my students, orients us to the cosmos, grounds us in Earth's living systems, nurtures us with water, air, and food. All the elements are nurturing us and transforms us with energy, with a zest for life. Thank you so much. Back to ground in life. So, Dr. Tucker, yes, you, I'm over here, up to the right. Oh, thank you. You're going to do so, the moderating. Yes. yes from okay. Here. Perfect. So, first of all, thank you so much for your inspiring remarks. They really are very hopeful. Um, we're going to start off just with some questions that have been submitted by people who were um, who, who sent them in advance to the library. Um, and one of those questions was, should we dedicate more financial resources to determine and publicize the benefits that nature provides to humans in the hopes that we can allocate even more resources to your, these kinds of efforts? And what, what do we do to get our governments to fund the commitments they've already made? Great questions. <laughs> the next COP meeting on climate change coming up in Egypt, beginning of November, and the whole issue is going to be finance. Are we going to finance from the developed world to the still developing world? That has not taken place. Many resentments and so on. Nature-based solutions, though, are emerging um, that says, as you conserve trees, forests, rainforests, and so on, um, that, that has to be financed. There's been a whole debt for nature swap, which is back into play right now, namely developing countries are saying, you're asking for our debt, but what if we conserve our, our biodiversity, our ecosystems, and so on? So all of these are at play. There's no question. And, you know, if we talk about finance, we can go in many, many directions. But one thing, and I hope it doesn't offend anybody, but one thing we can do is think about within our institutions of divestment 
and investment, namely divestment of problematic fossil fuels and investment in alternative energies. And the religious, there's now four, $40 trillion of divestment. And Bill McKibben started this movement maybe 12 years ago. A third of that is from religious communities because they don't want their pensions and so on invested in problematic things. So there's a lot of practical uh, things we can do along these lines. I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to invite the audience to come up and ask their own questions. And may I ask that when you do come up that you frame your thoughts in the form of a question and that you try to be succinct because there are probably many people who want to ask questions. But another question that was asked from um, the virtual audience is, how might artificial intelligence affect our approach to our environmental future? Well, that's a great question, as was the first, um, and both we could spend a lot of time on. Um, you know, at Yale, there's a center for virtual reality, and we went down there, and John put on the goggles and so on, and it's pretty mind-boggling, some of the virtual reality. Um, some of the AI, I'm not... I'm, pretty, I'm not myself enamored of, but I think there's some potential of, for sure, of understanding ecosystems. And, and if we can use like all of these technologies for good, for understanding, for scientific creativity and ecological solutions, I think that's great. But when they become distractions and uh, put more people within the bubbles that we're already in with computers and iPhones and all of us, um, it's not giving us that sense that Barry was trying to say of intimacy, the unfiltered intimacy with nature itself. So I'm, I'm just speaking of my ambivalence, but I think we definitely have to explore it and see how it can be used for the good. Thank you. Now I invite the audience to come up if people would like to ask questions themselves. Please feel free to step up. Oh, come on. <laughs> Who's going to be the first? <laughs> OK. Well, thank you very much for that very good presentation. Very interesting. And I think I know when I was in school, uh, we tried to integrate science and, and, and philosophy and make sense of the world that way. And we did it on our own. But uh, we didn't get that kind of encouragement from from the academic world. Uh, I think what may be required here to reach this level that you're talking about is a kind of a revolution in consciousness. People have to expand their consciousness. They have to develop their awareness and it requires almost another level of understanding in order to do what you're suggesting. That's, uh, that's my question. Uh, mm -hmm. If you will comment on that, that'd be great. Thanks, Bill. I think that's absolutely right. And um, sometimes people think, oh, consciousness might be woo-woo or something. No. Our dean, um, Gus Speth, who was one of the great environmentalists, uh, and brought us to Yale because he said he founded, he went to Yale undergrad, Yale Law School, founded NRDC, Natural Resources Defense Council, worked in the Carter administration, was head of UN development program, and so on. And he said, we don't have this integration. And he did a conference that we helped him with on um, toward a new consciousness at Aspen, which was extraordinary. So what I'm saying is academia doesn't always go inside that window, that door, but I think it's a huge gate that's opening and opening and opening. There's no question because in part, the suffering of the last few years with pandemics, loss, losing family and friends and economic difficulties and so on. And as Peter and Sarah and I like to talk about, what do you do with your suffering? What do you do with it? So a lot of people are into mindfulness practice. I just came from a conference on mindfulness for the earth that UConn did a secular institution with a very high level provost in global studies. So I think there's spiritual techniques, there's qigong, there's yoga, and so on, which puts us into systems. I mean, tai chi is doing bird movements and so on, or yoga with the 
uh, bowing to the sun. These are movements that put us in touch with the living earth. So the change of consciousness be between eco-spirituality with the earth and a re-understanding of the cosmos is part of where we are. We have a long way to go. And I, I mean, I hope in my, I like to call it refirement days, I'm going to do more of these kinds of practices, you know, bringing this in. And I suspect in UU and Methodist churches and so on, there's possibilities for um, creating these new consciousness, these new rituals for mourning the loss of species, and yet saying we're at a new morning, new possibilities. So it's a long answer to a really important question that shouldn't be taken off the table. This is, you can call it, many people do, paradigm shift, new worldviews. I like to keep everything plural, but that's, we're in the midst of it, and we don't have the full perspective, but for sure, we're in the midst of it. Yes? Right, great. So the question was, what are efforts in early, maybe grammar school and pre-grammar school um, for a sense of the sacred without calling it religious? And, you know, I appreciate the separation of church and state, as I'm sure we all do. Um, so there, there are a number of things. First of all, in terms of the Journey of the Universe, there's three extraordinary books done for children by Jennifer Morgan um, on the understanding the processes of nature and so on. Um, so that's important. There's mindfulness practices, as you may know, already in the schools that don't use overtly religious language, but just calming children down, giving them a moment of silence. Um, when I do, when I teach Buddhism and I teach them a little bit about Zen meditation, the students are like, oh my God, this is wonderful. You know, even at this conference, it was up at Old Lyme, there was a Buddhist monk from Sri Lanka. And, you know, just that sense of calm that um, can be evoked in five minutes. It doesn't have to be a whole retreat or whatever. So I think things are coming into the schools because the sense of uh, mental health is so huge. This is why UConn is doing it. All of our mental health uh, faculties are way overstretched. So what are we going to offer? So again, we could you know talk a lot more on this. And um, there's a school in New Jersey um, called R uh, Ridge and Valley School, which the whole curriculum uh, from kindergarten through sixth grade is all about the universe story. And these students are extraordinary, so creative, so creative. So, great question. What else? Time is for one up? last question, okay. if someone would like to ask it. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you, Dr. Tucker. Um, I have a 24-year-old daughter, bright, world traveler, awe of nature. I can't get her to recycle. She's like, Mom, it's a scam. She says, it's a scam. Now, I know she cares. How do we bridge that cynicism to action? Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny because there's an article in the New York Times on climate. It was an intergenerational thing. It was one of these things sort of to the side, but it was like parents criticizing their children for being on their phones too much or wa being wasteful, and then vice versa, <laughs> the children criticizing their parents for too much travel or whatever, or buying too many clothes, et cetera. So, um, it's, it's a complicated thing, isn't it? This intergenerational critiquing and so on. I mean, the scam thing is because the market fell out of recycling, unfortunately. And we also thought we would give our waste overseas. You know, the amount of computer and technical waste that went to China and India, and India had places along the... Uh, edge of, of the Indian Ocean and so on, where laborers, barefoot laborers, were de uh, taking apart ships 
with incredibly toxic materials and so on. So, you know, we have a whole range of things about how we're going to solve this waste problem, um, including some equity uh, of who's going to be doing it and, and so on. But, you know, so I'm not sure where we are with the market. That's the problem, because a lot of markets uh, were cut off for a range of reasons, for our collective waste recycling, you know, being at the sort of the core. But again, I, I'm horrified by what we recycle, you know, the plastic that things come in and of course with food orders and in and out, we're, we're all complicit in this, right? That we, it's, we can't um, avoid it. But I would say that it's part of the rituals we need to put into our society that give a sense of authentic care and change. Now, I've lived in Japan for three years. Every city, including Tokyo, has the most incredible uh, recycling systems. And you don't mess around because there's recycling police on it. Europe, tremendous recycling and so on. We are the outlaws a bit, and if we are the entrepreneurs that I know we are, we can solve this problem of what's the market and, and so on. Uh, we can do this. I, I feel we should do it, and we can do it. Dr. Tucker, I want to thank you on behalf of all of us for coming down here and laying out this vision for us. We have a few gifts for you, and I know I, for one, am going to go up right out and buy some of those books you, you mentioned to us. Thank you very much. We appreciate your welcome. coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, and I hope you will feel hopeful, inspired, good not we're all sad at times there's no doubt but you know we have family we have friends we have grandchildren or children who are going to bring that bright light into our lives and i'm so happy to see you smiling because that's what we need more than anything so take those smiles home <laughs> and broadcast them tomorrow okay thank you